Well, thank you both for being here. I really appreciate you, you both here, uh, Mike Potter, John Cameron Mitchell, um, the creatives behind uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Um, I, I wanted to start, uh, first of all, uh, just by asking John maybe just a, a couple just quick questions about his uh, originating this uh, musical in the first place. Um, how it came about, because um, it's, a, it's a film that started in the theater after it was a film that went on Broadway, so it's had a few lives, but um, how did you originate the story with, um, uh, with your partner, uh, the composer, Stephen Trask, and um, how did you um, end up, um, you know, collaborating then with Mike? That was a long, that's a long, <laughs> long, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Um, well, uh, I always wanted to make a theater piece uh, that was using rock and roll. And I had the origin of love myth from Plato's Symposium in mind. And I was looking at different stuff from my life growing up in the military. And uh, Stephen Trask, I met on an airplane and then we kept bumping into each other and we saw each other's work. I saw his band Cheater. He saw me in a musical called Hello Again and we decided we really have to work together. So I would tell him stories and the most interesting character to him in my life was my babysitter, my brother's babysitter, Helga, who was a German divorced army wife who became the model for Hedwig. We were working, well, he was the head of the house band of a punk drag club called Squeezebox, which was a far cry from RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> um, and uh, I was amazed by all these incredible performers. And Mike was going there too, and little did I know. And he was working at the, at the you want to tell the story how we met? Oh yeah, I was working at Kim's video in um, the, the eponymous, infamous uh, video store in the, um, Manhattan. And I worked in the, um, West Village and John was my customer. I've, I've berated him, I'm sure. Yeah, for like, well, how dare you rent that? I was so mean to him. Than the usual. But then I saw, we re remember we had seen each other out. So we kind of started talking. Flirting a little. Yeah. But I was saying, I want to do this character called Helga at that time. And well, I had done one already. You had done yeah, one. I had done one gig there. Uh, and my... Uh, colleague in the secret garden, Peter Marinos did my makeup and he used to call any short guy with a Napoleon complex, the angry inch. And I thought, oh, that's a good name. Oh, really? <laughs> so Mike did my second gig there where when I was a host, a guest host for Mistress for Mike. And yeah. Tell her the story of the wig. That was a disaster. Well, John wanted like, you know, these wings and I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I told this story before, but I decided I was just going to take paper, toilet paper rolls and, you know, wrap hair around it and like staple it and hot glue it. So it was like that shape. It was very, you know, it looked like it should. It looked like an air conditioning duct. Well, that was later. I used air conditioning duct later, actually, in a wig that actually flew off your head at, at Fez, remember? Yeah. Um, but anyway, this wig was kind of ratchet and ratty and... Um, and so we walked in and some woman, he had a cup of tea in his hand, he was coffee. coffee, and she like slammed the door open and the tea went all over his face. And I was like, oh God, this is a nightmare. Makeup didn't move, thank God. But he got on stage I and- was just Latina all of a sudden. He got on stage and um, started dancing. And by the end, all of the hair was like dangling with like toilet paper rolls just hanging off the ends. And I was like, wow, that was fun. I'll never see these. I'll never, I'll never see again. those people again because they're not going to hire me ever again. But they did. They Got hired to him later doing a feature film as the head, makeup, and hair, um, having never done a film before. The head and the wig. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, I think it, the running makeup was an inspiration, wasn't it, in some ways? Well, it, you know, that was uh, that was because we had no choice on stage because she doesn't ever leave the stage. So all bets are off. If she looks good in the first 30 seconds and falls apart, then it was, that... it was meant was designed to decay. Yeah, I but it's designed to decay. In the film, we can control it. And it was, you know, much more beautiful affair. <laughs> Plus, John is so beautiful. Yeah, me too. That's still, right. To still, darling, still. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, this is a, a, a film that is, um, as you know, started again, as we said, the theater, 
went to film. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about the film, the how you even got this film made. I mean, it, it went. It was a with Chris. We did it with Killer Films. Um, how yeah, did it? Well, how did it get Leslie, started? I mean, as you know, Leslie, in the U.S., there were three golden eras of film, and you can say the first started in the '30s and went to the '50s, and then. Second was 69, 68 with Easy Rider, you know, through the 70s. The 80s was a bit of a, a mess, some hangover from the 70s and some very Reagan-esque fantasies. <laughs> and then the 90s, you know, starting with Sex, Lies and Videotape till about, I'd say 2005 or six when the collapse happened was a golden age. And you would have films that would never be made today with those casts, with those budgets, with those stories, you know, with hardcore sex, like short bus, with sensitive, you know, stuff like uh, Happiness by Todd Solon, you know, an incestuous mm -hmm. comedy. It was unbelievable. And so things were happening all over the world at that time. And we had the opportunity, we had a bidding war. So when the film, uh, sorry, when the play came out off Broadway with our director, Peter Askin, Stephen Trask and I were suddenly, even though we weren't, uh, it wasn't a big theater hit. It was more like the people who hated musicals would come and it was never a hot ticket. It was more hanging on by her press ons. You know, yeah. the usual head big was always barely making it. And, but suddenly Glenn Close and Danny DeVito and Forrest Whitaker and Tim Burton are all there and they all want to help make the film. Um, Danny DeVito especially wanted to, to produce it. Um, he also had a record label um, and Stephen preferred Atlantic Records, which was, you know, the great Ahmed Erdogan. So that movie deal fell out because of that. His, Christine Vachon stepped in because New Line Cinema was ready to do it. Bob Shea had directed me in a film in the 80s called Book of Love and he was very impressed with, uh, with Hedwig and Mike DeLuca was the head of production. and. Mark Tusk, our buddy at Squeezebox, was an executive there. He used to be with Wine with Miramax. I don't know how we survived that. So there was kind of a family affair. And Stephen's manager, Paul Rosselli, had worked for New Line. His uncle was head of marketing. So there was a lot of connections to New Line. I had worked with New Line. Stephen had worked with New Line. Yeah. So they took care of us while they were making Lord of the Rings. And we were like the kind of favored, you know, freak of the, you know, Bob came out, you know, he did John Waters, you know, he, he was always an, a counterculture guy who had suddenly become mainstream with, you know, rush hour comedies and, and yeah. Eddie Murphy and this and that. And now he was in Austin Powers. And now he was making the biggest films of the year and making head, head big. And he didn't, he let me make it the way I wanted to, even though yeah. I had never directed a film. Well, in that year, you're exactly identified a very specific time, John. I think you're you're exactly wow. right. And he he let all those those big money movies pay for all the rest of it, right? And um, now they don't do the they don't do those small films. Yeah. They just they just make the big movies, right? They don't care. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely a different time. And you know, new queer cinema and even the advent of having queer programmers at big festivals. Um, I, you know, I remember that time as being so transformative that someone like Cooper could be the head of Sundance um, right. was actually like a really big deal in terms of the festival world and the difference between being at an LGBT festival and being at Sundance. And this yeah. was sort of that, that time period also of, 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 of a kind of, I hate to say it this way, but in a certain way of legitimizing queer cinema as well. Um, by putting it front and center at Sundance and yeah, there was it a big part. queer, beautiful queer. Um, one so, year, Southern Comfort was there when we were there. It was, but in the early eight, early nineties, you know, Poison and um, what's the Jenny Livingston? Um, Paris is burning. Oh, Paris is burning. Were the winners? Yeah, and it was like, oh my god, the queer underground film. And then the next year, I went to visit uh, Sundance and I saw the famous queer panel that Derek Jarman was on and Christine. Ruby Rich, and Rich yeah. Rich and learn, and she coined the term new queer cinema and, and Derek Jarman was certainly a, a godfather of that and yeah. Best Sant yeah. and, and, you know, Tom Keelan and uh, Christopher Munch, all these people who I admired 
who became friends. Um, I remember meeting Todd Haynes and, and uh, Jim Lyons, his collaborator and, and, and boyfriend, and they were just the coolest people alive. And oh, right. so we were, I was getting advice from the best, uh, from Sundance Lab and from the Christine Cachon uh, diaspora. <laughs> Many of the other designers like Therese Dupre, um, yeah. who was a brilliant production designer. Um, Frank DeMarco, who I was assigned at Sundance, became my cinematographer. Yeah. Uh, Ariane Phillips, who was very punk. We kind of plucked her out of LA. Yeah. And she was doing things <laughs> like the Crow and Tank Girl, and she was perfect. <laughs> for us. And I assigned, um, but and they'd no one balked at Mike Potter doing it because even though he'd never done the film, it, there was trust there. Well, when I got this there, place, trust. well, when they got there, when I got there, they balked. They were like, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to watch our people in Canada, the union people, do John. And I was like, absolutely not. No one is touching John but me because I act a little bit like a protector when he's yes. in the chair, you know, because he was surrounded by, by monitors, directing, <laughs> getting makeup. And I, that was a fatal error that I made, not having an assistant, because I ended up having to do all of his wigs and makeup myself, which never happens on a movie. It's always like a hair person and a makeup hair person. Department. And there also was 33 looks that I had to pull off, many in no, triplicates. But um, luckily, I've always said, luckily the hair and makeup was supposed to be bad-ish. It wasn't. I know, but John's so pretty. <laughs> My only thing was, I wanted John to be pretty. No matter what, how trashy, no matter how right. costumes, and I think that you know made Hedwig relatable. You know, people could did... be like not right. the monster. Pretty is relatable. Pretty is relatable when you're wearing a mask, or as Rex Reed I think said, a hideously deformed mask of hair and makeup. Don't take that as an exact quote, but I think that's what he said about my work. We'll do that. We'll, we'll do that research. We'll 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 we'll, we'll make. Maybe sure. I'm wrong. He definitely didn't like my hair and makeup. <laughs> he didn't like anything. About it. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, but Mike, what 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 was your inspiration? Because you do have all these different connections to. There's glam rock. There's punk. There's all these different you know, influences in there. I kind of grew up in like kind of rural America. So, you know, there's definitely that element, but you know, a lot of that person whose who's, uh, home is mobile. A little bit. Well, when I was young, we did have a mobile home, but then we moved into a full regular home. Um, crashed into it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of country music, a lot of, you know, Dolly, and then you got like Tina and, you know, there's so many people like Marlena Dietrich and, um, you know, David Bowie, but, um, you know, a lot of it really was Ariane, the costume designer. I took many wow. cues from her. Right. She would lead in a way with a look, and then Mike would adjust. And then John, perfectly. but then John right. sort of like, he did care about what we were doing and wanted to know, but I think he was so overwhelmed at one point, he was just like, do whatever you, do want. Whatever you want, I don't care. And we would, Ari and I would be like, oh, good. And she'd be like, well, I have these shoes, but I got nothing else. I'm like, well, I'll match the lips to the shoes. And we'll just, and she was so genius at, you know, putting stuff together. And most of it was very pre-planned on her part, but. And a lot of materials from earlier Hollywood yeah. movies. Yeah. She would use, like I was wearing Britney Spears skirt. In the kissing scene with Tommy, you were wearing Britney right. Spears skirt. Cameron Manheim's shirt from Charles. Cameron Diaz's Cameron shirt. Cameron Diaz. Their heart shirt was Cameron's. Um, from uh, all these movies, so we, it was very perfect. You know, Hedwig is kind of a hand-me-down person. And she also had very, Hedwig had very, very expensive custom-made wigs that I had made that were the, but then also there were $30 wigs from 14th Street in that movie. It takes a lot of money to look that cheap. Absolutely, <laughs> quote Dolly Parton. <laughs> What what about John? You touched on it a little bit, but what what about the other collaborations? Because this is, if anything, like just an extraordinary collaboration of so with so many different artists. And maybe you could just maybe talk about some of the other collaborations uh, on on this project as well. well. We talked about Ari. Therese was our punk rock veteran. She did Spike Lee films, and she did Christine and and Todd Haynes films, and she did Black Swan. Later, she did Black Aronofsky. Yeah. And so she's like the go to indie production designer in New York that was really down and dirty. She, her detail work was unbelievable. I mean, she was unbelievable. obsessive with the tiny tchotchkes on, on the desk and the drawer. 
stuff you would never see on camera, but it worked with the actors in a way, it put them in the place. And we had Germany, you know, East Germany in the eighties, we had trailer park, somehow Toronto became all of those things. Um, and so that was, we had a good year to prepare because of things were slowed down by the deal. So a lot of our collaborators worked for nothing to prepare, which really was vital because I didn't know what I was doing. And I needed, I couldn't just do it on the day the way other people could. You know, I had to really prepare and I had um, storyboards for a lot of scenes. Um, I met one of our art department people, Miguel Villalobos, who did things like Tommy's guitar and decorated the inside of the cave sure. and the bishop and a turtleneck puppet. Yeah. I just met him on the street. He was taking a picture of Lady Bunny on the street who lives near me and we hit it off and he came upstairs and we had sex. And then uh, he took a couple shots of me and then I introduced him to Therese and we both, uh, this is how things work. I want to see those the shots that he took of you. Yeah, some of them are online. In the 90s. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, Therese and I just were so impressed by his multi-talented work. Yeah. We both paid for him to be in Toronto and be our, in effect, our catch-all art um, person to just, he was brilliant. He, yeah. he remains brilliant. He does a lot of my posters still. Um, and, and Frank DeMarco, who I was assigned by Michelle Satter at the Sundance Labs and wasn't as well known then, but I went with him instead of the more famous people because we had a great, we had a great um, compatible personality and he lives nearby and he's done all of my film stuff. So. It's or amazing. Stephen Trask had his own music department and producers and musicians and he had a whole world with the score and the music. Um, Half the songs we wanted to record live because we hate lip syncing punk rock. <laughs> the ones that we could do live, others needed to not be live because we had to do more fluid camera work. But the scenes that are more like multi-camera crazy performances, we did many of those live. In post, we could, you know, if I messed up, we could always move a take, you know, onto my mouth. So I learned a lot. Uh, from my editor, Andrew Marcus, who was the editor of Merchant Ivory movies, you know, The Rain Remains of the Day, you know, yeah. Howard's End. So I had this incredible classical basis with him. And he was very, because I was in makeup sometimes, he would be shooting inserts. And one day we had Frank shooting one thing and another operator shooting something, the editor shooting. And, he had his own editing trailer on set, as I remember. He was like actively editing like, while we were there. While we yeah. were there, oh, wow. you know, it wasn't sort of like a, I don't know how all that works, but I just remember him being, having his own trailer where he was editing while we were shooting. I think because of the live singing stuff too, it had to be, yeah. you know, you can kind of figure it so out. So it was a great group of people, many of whom I continue to work with. Yeah. What, John, can you talk a little bit about the, the evolution of the audience response to the film? You know, can you can you remember even what it felt like maybe that first screening at Sundance and how that felt and how the audiences have reacted to it? Because also just in terms of the content, talking about things that now, you know, it seems like we talk about so openly, but at the time, you know, questions around gender, questions around, um, you know, uh, even just, just being so open about, you um, these topics were were like you know we're old gays so we're you know we yeah. remember back in the day when when it seems crazy to think that this wasn't something that people just talked about but uh, but in terms of people's reaction in the audience like it must have been very and continue to be very moving to see people's reaction to the film yeah you know it's interesting i was just at laverne cox's 50th birthday party and a lot of her friends are from the same time that we were creating Head Big and incredible, you know, Mike was doing drag then in, in nightlife. And there was a group of people, Mistress for Micah, Gerlina, Honey Dijon, uh, Nisham, Jackie Beat. Jackie Beat, Sherry Vine, who was kind of my drag mom. Um, and then Vaginal Davis, who kind mm. of Lady Bunny is the queen of them all. And it was a constant, you know, panoply of, talent but there wasn't any way to sell out because he couldn't make any real money so it was like true punk rock we're doing this 
for the sake of what we're doing, you know, because there was no way out. <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was insane. And RuPaul made a different landscape. Of course, th that generation didn't necessarily reap the benefits of it. And, you know, I still want Ru to do a true legends, uh, yeah. for, you know, show where these people that she grew up with are allowed to shine. Laverne was one of the great, you know, um, anomalies in that she found her own space and became a real spokesperson. Totally. And I love her. And, but I was hanging out with Lena and um, all these girls from the time. And they, many of whom are now trans, said to me, bless you and bless Hedby. Yeah. You know, lately we've been getting a little bit from many of the 19 year olds. It's like, oh, it's a trans role. Only trans people can play it. And it starts to looking for things to cancel. But the girls and men and, and, and uh, non-binary people who were coming up at that time found it useful, you know, to their story, to remind, because it's not a trans story. If someone's forced into an operation by a patriarchal government and boyfriend. It's really more about the binarchy telling you what it means to be men. Also, genders today are so specific. Back then, there was like girly boys. You know what yes. I mean? Sort of the like term tranny, like was like used as a, like umbrella. Uh, like um, you right. know, when men were glam and whatever. I mean, it was so. But now there's so many. There was no plus. I don't even know that the LGBT. What was it back then? LGBT. It was probably LG. LG. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I, then I, they I, went. I, I, I remember when trans got added and then they added the Q and then the plus, because Q yeah. you weren't even allowed to say back then. Q was not a good word. I, I, I can remember word. being at a board meeting. I was on the I was on the board of GLAD in the in the original national board of GLAD. Uh, yeah. And being in a meeting where people argued about whether bisexual should be included. Right? Oh and yeah, like, yeah. That was like the thing. And then it was like, well, okay, that passed. And then you know, but the fact that there was even a conversation about it in 1995 or 96, yeah. right, you know. Well, we were um, all coming out of AIDS and that AIDS was the galvanizing force behind a new queer rights movement, as well as just a pure survival movement. And, you know, getting people to not ignore the death of people who are not fitting into the, to the yeah. hegemony of the world. And so that radicalized us and Squeezebox and Hedwig came directly out of that kind of anger. Yep. And when you would go to these clubs, there were truly, there was fury and there was comedy and there was solidarity at, at these places at that time. And because we were fighting for our survival and um, I felt it to be very selfish to be in the closet if in the middle of AIDS, you know? So as an actor, even though I was told to stay in the closet, I just, rejected that and so I was always pretty out and um Hedwig was my way of kind of really busting out and Trask's way of really you know combining his incredible songwriting thing with a, a narrative which was unusual you know yeah. Tommy and these other rock operas weren't particularly tight narratives they were more song cycles so we were trying to make something new in that way responding to a world that I wasn't really part of, but I was hanging out in, which was the alternative drag scene. And it was suddenly combined with music that we loved. So it was a very exciting time. And Hedvig was a bit of a standard bearer for the misfit, the gender misfit, the queer misfit. As we all know, we know straight people who are much more queer than our certain straight acting gay friends. Absolutely. You know, so queer is a big umbrella. That, you know, that in, that I find porous and you can get under the umbrella or get out of it yeah. as long as you're with the program and you understand that gender is a, a fluid thing that has political implications, power implications, but we never felt the need to label ourselves with the specificity of today, which I think comes out of capitalism because once you can label it, you can sell it. Yeah, put it on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> So for me and for our generation, we have less of that. Oh, you can't say this, you can't say that. Because when you came out of AIDS and punk and stuff, you said it all. You said whatever needed to be said in that yeah, moment right. to get people's attention to survive. And you were called every name in the book in the process. And so you used yeah. every you lived, you survived. You or you did, didn't, but yeah, and you repurposed the names. Yeah, that's exactly you, right. You know, you repurposed them for 
for different consumption and you defang them and you play around with them. So we get, our generation gets a little annoyed when young people are like, we can't say this, kids. So I'm hanging out with Laverne's crew and they're all like, these damn kids tell me what I can do when I'm like 50 years old and that's about the goddamn thing. So don't tell me what the hell I'm supposed to do. And they all say the T word, by the way. Oh yeah, there's a tranny. <laughs> all my trans friends. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, don't tell me this was never a bad word. <laughs> but that it's up to everyone's person. And the young people yes. certainly have good intention. Absolutely. Yeah, and well, they do. Yeah, they so do. It's just the tactics are different. And I don't think we need one kind of tactic. No. no. Well, I quite I'm agree. going with the kids these days. So I like that. I can't even remember. <laughs> well, it is also about seeing, you know, representation, right? And that doesn't change this idea of being able to see yourself reflected. Or better. Yeah. And you know, yeah. it's so funny because I have friends, straight friends, whose kids love Hedwig and they're like, oh, I'd much rather my kid watch Hedwig every day than Barney or whatever. And like, I had no, actually no kids. And there was a guy that came that we met on an airplane who came up to me and he recognized me. And I was like, how does this kid? Cause I don't know. But anyway, turns out his mother was into Hedwig. He was born listening to Hedwig and he came when he was 18 to see you at town hall a few years ago. But he was just a straight kid who really loved Hedwig it and it was, had nothing to do with Sexuality. any sexuality thing but yeah, yeah I, I love that you know yeah. that, that, did you that see that cover. john in the in the transition to it being a broadway show where you had so many different people like broadway is like a whole other world right where tourists yeah. people from around the country and yeah. you know they're well, just we were doing it off broadway you know every theater in new york rejected us and peter askin our director producer had to build an off-broadway theater for us in the Hotel Riverview, which had bulletproof front desk, you know, <laughs> God. and dead bodies coming out. People were dying coming out yeah. the door. <laughs> so we had to create our own place. And we were never a big hit, like I said. We often had silent audiences, as you see in the film. And we just incorporated that. But slowly the world moved towards us rather than us moving towards the world. And Broadway, other shows like American Idiot and stuff show that different kinds of music could be musicals. So finally, we were allowed to be on Broadway in 2014. And it, it took a Neil Patrick Harris, a very mainstream star, to bring it yeah. to people who yeah. thought they might be afraid of it. So I really am grateful for his expertise and showmanship to really uh, include, you know, honor its true source and, and heart, but also make it not palatable, but be an ambassador for something that really is very Broadway, in, in my view, pretty mainstream. Absolutely. You know, it's just the, yeah. some of the, uh, it's like everybody gets a message from it, no matter what. Yeah. It seems like. Including my aunt, who's an 87 year old nun, you yeah. know, just loves it, you know, and um, she's the coolest person in my family. Yes. Terry. Terry. <laughs> Terry. <laughs> And how, how have you seen, um, you know, when you, when you interact with young people, you know, young queer people, even over the years, has their, how they receive the film changed in your perception and the questions they ask or the things that they well, talk about? Well, like I said, about? a couple of people have, and I've showed Short Bus recently because we re-released that. Um, here's an example of a Short Bus. Hedvig seems to somehow be, you know, we, there was a production in Australia that was derailed by the trans activists who said it has to be a trans actor, which was so short-sighted. They just wanted the role. They, I mean, they could have canceled the piece since I wasn't trans from yeah. the natural conclusion of their argument, but they didn't, they just wanted the role. And the cis gay guy who was playing it was outraged. It's like, how do you know what my sexual, my gender is? Exactly. It's like, you're just assuming. It's like, and what if we're not trans enough? You know, do you have to be binary trans? Can you be non-binary? You know, it, it's it's a slippery slope when you start controlling casting. I understand when you have a black character and a black actor, but this is very flexible. And the character is not on a trans journey, they're on a gender journey and drag is what they use. Yeah. Rock and roll and drag. And my friend Peppermint, who is the wonderful Broadway singer, trans, came out of the drag world, says that. It, the character is, incidentally trans, but it's not, you know, has no agency. And in fact, they're a victim, but it's drag that saves them. So 
most people understand that. But with Short Bus, when it came out, again, it was interesting to have Q and A's because a young person, they all loved it, but the young people were looking for things to cancel. And yeah. one of them said, uh, "Is it really your story to tell of an Asian woman seeking her orgasm?" And I said, "Yes, it is," yeah. because <laughs> Sukhian Lee and I and all the actors developed the script together for two and a half years. We added elements of her life and of my life to her character, to all the characters, and they are all our stories to tell. When you do it the right way, when you go in there, when you add an element from your own life, when you use the actor's input, which is how I always work and my favorite filmmakers work, you create something that is kind of an amalgam character of the actors and the writers and the director. Yeah. And if you're doing it right, it is your story. The next question was, have you considered remaking Short Bus with a more diverse cast? I was going to say, I refer you to the previous question. Is that yeah. my story to tell? But then what do you mean remake? I can barely get anyone to want to have sex in an art film. You know, I barely could get those people. I couldn't get a lesbian couple, for example. And it was always a mix. And I'd have a great, say, black actor who was not attracted to the white one. You know, it's like I had to work with what I had. And yeah. I say, that's your film to make, not to remake Short Buzz, but to make your own film. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Um, let's all tell our stories. They don't have to be autobiographical. And in fact, that is the thing lately. It's like, that's not your story to tell. You can keep slicing and dicing that to the point where we only make autobiographies. Well, that's what I think Laverne said about Jenny Livingston with Paris is Burning. She was like in that the, the, the documentary, I'm blanking on the name of it. She was like, yeah, maybe she did step in in a world that she shouldn't have been. But she was so glad that she did and that she was so glad that it got made in that time because you know there was no she shouldn't have been she no was just she, saying it wasn't no no work. she wasn't saying she shouldn't but there are people that say that she kind of injected herself in a world and that laverne was saying even if that's the case she's just glad that somebody did inject themselves into that world because it opened it up to the absolutely world. and to yeah. one thing about your question you had asked previously about the fans the one thing I personally have noticed over the last 25 years is the fans keep getting younger and younger. And I find that very interesting, like teenagers outside the theater on Broadway, like in the summer on their summer vacations, like just sleeping in, you know, I was, that was kind of what moved me and made me feel like she has a future Hedwig. So yeah. the kids, so hopefully they, you know. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at because I think, you know, it is still resonates for people. It's just, it's, different Absolutely. You know, when we saw it it was different when we first saw it and now yeah. you know we can see what it means to younger people and you know their perception of the world is so much different thank god and they're looking at things differently yeah. and another way, i'm glad yeah. that they are but i also get you know i also get kind of annoyed because it's like guys as you split hairs and look for impurity in your allies and friends yeah we got real enemies absolutely who are trying yeah. to crush to yeah. crush our trans rights, to crush our reproductive rights, yeah. to crush, you know, to just open up the world to more danger. And we sometimes spend, because of the Trump years, a lot of young people were like, we got to do something. So we, you end up doing the rats in the cage thing and looking for the impurities in your next door neighbor and your collaborator. And you start to get, everyone starts to get really scared to say anything. Yeah. Um, lest they say the wrong thing. And I, people say, oh, it's a corrective time and it'll settle. I'm hoping that is the case because yeah. I also have known people losing their livelihoods for out of context remarks that really should not have ended their life. Yeah. But could be, you know, brought up in a different way. Yeah. Call in instead of call out. Of course, there's rapists and then there's just someone who's your, your grandpa who's making, a, you know, an old fashioned shaky green joke about someone's tits. And it's like, there is a difference here, you know what I mean? And let's try to do this with love and not become school marms about it and lose our sense of humor yeah. about it. And moral well, compasses. <laughs> I don't feel do like I have the right that, to judge me. Well, what, what do you think though that um, younger people are connecting to when they when they experience this now? What I mean, I, I just think they, 
see, you know, so many of the people that seem to kind of fall into Hedwig definitely have come from a bit of strife in their own head. And I've heard, I mean, I can, a thousand times Hedwig saved my life or Hedwig, you know, is the reason I'm married to this person. And um, I think it's a real great connector for people. And I think anybody old, young, any race, any gender can find something in that because it's just about what's inside of you, no matter what that is, you know, if it's, if it's something that you know, or you don't know that you find out later, I mean, it's a journey. And I, and I do think that, um, I think that the kids, I don't know, maybe they're just into the sparkly hair and makeup and costumes. I don't know. That's what a lot of people are attracted to initially. I mean, a lot of people don't get that message the first time. They have to listen to those words and those lyrics and the, the words that John wrote and that Stephen wrote and uh, to get what they get from it. But in, in the end, it's just highly entertaining. Yeah. You know, someone, well, that, was someone that, was, that was deaf, that had no subtitles, could be entertained by that movie just by pure visuals alone so in my opinion yeah, well, I, yeah. oh sorry go ahead no no i was just going to ask i was just wondering because of the music and the musical element and i'm imagining kids listening to the soundtrack wherever they are wherever they are on the yeah. wall you know listening to the original and listening to the broadway and you know that that is so meaningful we all remember those songs that and things that we connected to when we played a million times on our cassette tapes and <laughs> rewound it and you know totally uh, made mixed tapes of it <laughs> yeah. remember when we record off the radio and they had the top 100 and yeah. we would like hold our cassette for number one and plus record what was the number one song in the country that week yeah <laughs> i'm doing a new uh, concert tour uh with amber martin who's my incredible cabaret partner and we're gonna do our first show july 23rd at uh prospect park band shell oh. for celebrate brooklyn and it's called cassette roulette is it <laughs> and we we spin this cassette of fortune in that in that's what song we do. We choose the song. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So we're kind of- I used of, to have, I remember my- Songs then, right? <laughs> I remember that my prized possession for a period of time was my cassette to cassette recorder. Oh yeah. The, the, double, the double cassette. And then I had the manual rewinder of the, the Radio Shack rewinder of the cassette. That was- I still have that. Do you know what I had? I, I had the yellow Sportsman waterproof Sony Walkman cassette oh, yeah. thing. And I found it in a bottom of a box of junk. And some woman paid like 180 bucks for it on eBay. <laughs> she wanted it for a prop for something. And I was like, sure. I was kind of blown away. I was going to throw it in the trash. <laughs> Everything, you know, all those things are like the manual. Retro, yeah. Just It's crazy to think about where we've come. Even in, you know, the film industry, that and have making films and how you made films and how we all did down and dirty you know for so many years uh, the technology you know allows us to do more but i think i just want to circle back to something you said earlier john about the ability to make a film like hedwig now and um the chances that people take and you know i mean is it you know is this like a, a film that wouldn't get made or is it a film that would be made for netflix or you know what <laughs> Well, it wouldn't be made as a feature now at that budget with that cast. Um, the bottom's fall out, fallen out of independent film, because starting with digital, the end of DVDs, streaming, people not going to theaters for small films anymore. The smart people will go see the dumb film instead of seek out the interesting film of the week like they used to. Some people will, but it's not like it used to be. And then, so they sometimes are made for streaming, but then, the films are not the focus there. And once in a while, there's a giant film like Roma or something. But you know, independent films are not really being nurtured by streamers either, unless there's a possibility of an Oscar, which doesn't allow for things like Hedwig. We never saw Hedwig being possible for an Oscar because of homophobia. And she got nominated for a Golden Globe for Hedwig. We did. That was you did. That, yeah, that was New Line Cinema really pushed it up for that. So that was an, un, an unusual thing, but we knew we would never win. And we would never be up for Tony's or, you know, we wouldn't be on Broadway. Things have changed. So maybe Hedvig would be a series now, if it's possible, but um, I don't know. It's like, it's a different, 
landscape and I don't mind it because I work different in different worlds. You know, I don't need to just make films. You know, I'm working on TV shows and podcasts and, and albums and concerts and stage. So there's always some other way to tell a story for me. Uh, it's just unfortunate that the beautiful form of small film has kind of gone out of fashion. No, I, I think that's a, a big, big difference. And I think we, we see that a lot in, um, you know, the, in the art house film world yeah. and those films that are being you have to make it an and... event now for people to go and yeah but we're thrilled that uh Hedvig is going to be at Governor's Island right? yes been. I'm outdoors gonna, I'm going to be DJing. wait John did you just say you've never been to Governor's Island no you haven't oh, oh my gosh John you're going to have such a wonderful time it's I I, I have also I, I grew up in New York and I never went there you're coming uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna be there. I will be there. I'm introducing. I'm I'm the hostess with the most desk. Um, but I uh, I think um, it's just an astonishing place, and you're gonna go and you're gonna say I'm gonna come back tomorrow, and I'm gonna ride my bike around, and it's just extraordinary, and it's right like over there. It's like right know, there. So cool. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's well, cool, and the screening is great. I'm gonna DJ with Michael Cavadias from seven to eight thirty till the film goes on introduce it, uh, maybe sing a song or two. And mm -hmm. so come on, Zion. Yeah, um, I'll be there. We're gonna be there with our- uh, Drawing some eyebrows. Blankets. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. bringing a folding chair. I got, yeah, I got one right there. Yeah, bring Thank a chair. You. Yeah. yeah. Well, we really, I, I really appreciate you being on the podcast and we are looking forward absolutely to our, to our big screening on Governor's Island this Friday. And um, if, if people are listening, they should make sure to check out filmlink.org slash uh, Hedwig for more information. And you can find out more about the ferries. Um, you just have to make sure you sign up for the ferry to get out there, but you can certainly go out and go out out early if you want and spend the day there there's lots of things to do and if you want to spend the night there's glamping that's what i heard i haven't been really? there. there's glamping that's i don't know about fun. that when's the last oh, no. ferry I'm when is saying. the last ferry though um i don't know off the top of my head but we their ferries are um we hold the ferries uh after for the movie so oh, cool. there are extra ferries that are that are made for the movie. Awesome. Um, and I just want to shout out to our friends at uh, Governor's Island and to New Fast who are uh, collaborating with us on the sc screening as well. So um, I really look forward to seeing you both there. And I'm so excited yes. to be DJing, John. I'm very excited. Oh, so. Thank you, Leslie. So nice to thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Right, and um, I'll see you soon. And thanks really for the time. And John, I remember interviewing you when we did when you did short bus for that the film I did, Indie Sex. And it was at that time when, you know, uh, there were so many moments of people trying to do kind of real sex in film. And that just it really did go away, didn't it? it really went just, away. Sex went away, went into the internet. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of are the kids having sex and again? The kids aren't having as much sex. Oh. It's very strange. I blame the internet. And yeah, and it just, it's the internet. Blame it all. You would think internet. with all the dating apps, it's like who's five feet away though. You know what I mean? It's Minus easier to have sex, I would think. Minus one inch away. <laughs> all right, I gotta go. All right, see you guys. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.